Hello, daughters of the American Revolution. My name is Howard Sheldon Wright. I'm honored to be presenting to a 130-year-old organization steeped in lineage, heritage, and history. With that said, I'd like to start with a brief story on the importance of asking about your family history. I grew up a baseball fan, just like my father. He was from Pittsburgh, so he was a Pirates fan. I was born in Pasadena, so I became a Dodgers fan. Perhaps some of you are too. In an effort to connect with my father, I picked Pirates star right fielder, the late Roberto Clemente, to be my favorite player. Later, as an adult, after I began working on my family tree, I learned from one of my dad's relatives that one of my dad's cousins, Clarence Bruce Jr., had played for the Homestead Grays, a Negro Leagues team near Pittsburgh in the 1940s. My dad even attended some of his games. Upon finding this out, I asked my father why he never told me about this fact when I was growing up, considering our shared interest in the sport and it being his first cousin. My dad's answer was, <laughs> you never asked. Since the time that I was invited to present today, I've learned that beginning in the 1980s, your organization has supported a project to identify minorities who were patriots of the American Revolution beyond soldiers. I've read about Mary Hemings Bell and Wilhelmina Rhodes Kelly. You're traveling on a path of inclusion and embracing more of the whole of the American experience. I applaud that. Perhaps in a very small way, my time with you today is an extension of that effort. You're creating connections. You're bridging. We need that. Because we are living in polarizing times. However, it's not the first time our country has walked in these shoes. Now, our physical existence can be broken down into genealogical threads, right? It seems that what your organization is trying to do is stitch new threads into the fabric of our nation's discourse. Let us, today, stitch together. I'm going to share what I think I know about African American genealogy, largely from a series of stories related to my family history pursuits, some of which you may already be familiar with in a general way, and some not. When I'm done, I hope I'll have been successful at stitching my journey into your minds and hearts. As best as I can recall, my journey began in the backyard of my grandparents' home in 1960s Pasadena. Their names were Grant and Edmonia Bowman, both of mixed race from Halifax County, Virginia, by way of New York, where my mother was born. When they were coming of age, one of the more common terms for people who were of various percentages of black and white ethnic backgrounds was mulatto. Today, they would be called mixed race. African Americans, or black people, of mixed ancestry have historically had an advantage over those who are not in most all aspects of life. This is also true in the case of genealogy pursuits because lighter skin often meant more liberties enjoyed, even for slaves. For free people of color, usually mulattoes, employment and head of household status was afforded. Marriages were recognized and land could be owned and transferred. The records of these people are also more easily available today to locate. Not so much for darker African Americans, who usually weren't free. This was especially common in the Deep South. My grandfather was a gregarious man and great at storytelling. As a child, I enjoyed sitting under the avocado tree listening to him. I relished every word. He was the second of nine children. Stories of his coming of age in Virginia delighted me. He was a storyteller, passing down wisdom and family history alike. Storytelling was an important way that African Americans shared their history. But I'll talk more about that later. In about 1970, my parents, Howard and Barbara Wright, signed me up for Cub Scouts. I remember three things about Cub Scouts. A camping trip, Pinewood Derby cars, and American Heritage Achievement Number 6, Making a Family Tree. Filling it out was pretty easy, mostly because of my grandfather. It became my first written-out family tree. I still have it, 50 years later. By the way, 
My mother signed off on it on 2-7 of 1970. This was my introduction to the importance of writing down your history. For many African Americans, though, without an oral history tradition, most of my ancestors would have found it impossible to pass down their stories. Oral history, shared through spoken word and occasionally song, was not as much a choice in America, but an imperative. Many blacks could not read or write, which could be a life-threatening skill, as it was illegal for slaves to read or write. Even later during Reconstruction, when the government took major steps to afford all black people a more equitable place in society, it was short-lived. With the rise of black codes and the KKK, separate but equal was not equal at all. This reality impacts African-American people today trying to piece together the lives of their forefathers and mothers through conventional channels. The limitations of segregation for African-American people gaining an equitable foothold in society were furthered. African-Americans could live and die in parts of the country and leave only a faint footprint in history. I can't say if this was something that was on my grandfather's mind or not. For him, it may have merely been the simple passage of time with his big man, his pet name for me. He, by definition, was a griot, a West African storyteller, from Halifax, Virginia. In spite of this auspicious beginning, my family history pursuits went on hiatus for about two decades, though I have remained an avid collector of family photos given to me by my parents and other relatives. On April 13, 1991, my sister Sandra gave me a Bible as a gift for having graduated from business school. It was the family history pages in the back of the book that inspired me to formalize my family history work. Shortly thereafter, I bought a big roll of white paper, transparent tape, and a black pen to begin construction of a more extensive family tree. This was before the time of widespread Internet usage. Though there are many digital genealogical tools at my disposal today, I still update my paper copy too. After reading a story about someone else's family history efforts in the local paper, the Pasadena Star News, I wrote to the editor to let them know I was making progress on my tree too. They came to my home in Altadena, interviewed me with my parents about my work in August of 1996. The reporter even asked my opinion on behalf of readers how to go about their own family tree research. I was proud to share what I had learned up to that point, which was to begin with yourself. Two years later, in May of 1998, KGEM, the local cable TV station in Monrovia, had me on to discuss my family tree pursuits. In this instance, I also opined on African American history that I had learned up to that point, including the importance of oral history, the challenges of inquiring about family history in states where segregation was more prevalent, and actually obtaining family records in those same states. Black folks with ancestry in the Deep South, like South Carolina, Georgia, and parts of Virginia, contend with a history of significant destruction to certain cities, which impacted local records offices. Keep in mind, reliable antebellum records on African Americans would already be limited because they were not counted in the census in the same way as whites. They were only identified by first names usually, ages were estimated, they could not own land, legally marry, and death records were and are limited on ancestral databases. These are among the issues that black people face in digging up history today. It was also as a guest on this program that I shared my oversized family tree companion binder, which contains all of my paper records, like photos, birth, marriage, and death records. I was accumulating these documents based on recommendations from two main sources. First, the volunteer staff at the LDS Family History Center in West Los Angeles. Those folks knew their stuff. I suspect they still do. When they weren't giving me advice on where to write for what, I was in their microfiche room spinning film with other family history enthusiasts. Maybe some of you have been there too. Second, I found a wonderful professional genealogist, Bridget Burkett. She was, and still is, very influential not only in what she has found for me, which is a lot, but also the question she poses to me on what else I should be looking for. 
The cool thing about her was that, for a time, she actually lived close to the offices where she did her research for me. So I think I got more personalized and more thoughtful searches from her. Additionally, I learned from Bridget not to put too much stock in family trees which are posted online, but to stick primarily to documented sources, such as Virginia's Free Black Registers, Cohabitation Registers, the Freedmen's Bank Records, Court Cases, and Chancery Records, where families squabbled about inheritance, which often included slaves. It was from these two main resources that I made the following discoveries that have significantly influenced the trajectory of my research. On the Evans branch of my maternal family tree, Bridget found a Prince Edward County, Virginia court record from 1821, naming my great-great-great-great-grandmother Fanny Evans, along with her two children, 18-year-old Winnie and 14-year-old Drury. Fanny was described as a free woman of color. Basic math puts her birth date at approximately the mid to late 1780s, not long after the American Revolution. 180 degrees in the opposite direction, figuratively, and 68 miles literally to Birch Creek, Virginia, my genealogist uncovered a record of a slave birth about 30 years later, on August 3, 1853. That slave's name was George Hughes, my maternal grandmother's paternal grandfather. His surname came from his owner, Woodson Hughes. My maternal grandfather was a griot, a storyteller. His wife, my grandmother, was not. She largely kept her story to herself, except for an occasional mention of family surnames, like Hughes, her maiden name, Evans, Pounds, Daniel, and Walton. Perhaps the information about her paternal grandfather's origins was too painful to share on the assumption she was even aware of it. To make the Woodson Hughes discovery even more fascinating is that in 2010, I randomly looked up the name Woodson Hughes on the internet to learn more about him, and I discovered that the slave owner Woodson Hughes' name was passed down to the current living Woodson Hughes, near my own age. At the time, he ran an art gallery and worked in a Halifax County library. When I first reached out to him online, it was weird. Perhaps something like the weird a few of you may feel today. But I leaned into the uncomfortable. When I told him what our connection was, there was a pause. And then Woodson reached out to me with open digital arms. He even asked if we were related. When I told him probably not, he seemed disappointed. Back and forth we chatted for months. In 2011, I took my nine-year-old daughter Allison to Virginia to participate in a family reunion in Norfolk, and while we were there, we also took the opportunity to drive three hours to Halifax to meet Woodson Hughes. We still communicate with each other to this day. Just this past summer, I decided to follow up on a lead given to me by a late relative on my dad's paternal side. Her name was Helen Hardwick, first cousin of my father's who wrote me a letter back in 1991, stating that my paternal grandfather, James Andrew Wright, had attended Tuskegee Institute around the turn of the 20th century. I filed that letter in my binder. However, it wasn't until summer of 2020, literally eight months ago, that I wrote to the registrar at Tuskegee to obtain James Andrew Wright's report card from 1906. My paternal grandfather ended up in St. Louis and later Pittsburgh, where he met my grandmother, Sarah Eva Bruce, in church. They were married in 1918. James was among the roughly six million African Americans who pulled up their stakes and left the Jim Crow South in search of jobs beside sharecropping between 1916 and 1970. They went to the West, the Northeast, and where my grandfather went, the Midwest. Just to make this discovery even sweeter, James' older brother, Harrison, was listed as a relative on the report card. This past October, I had my daughter Allison give that report card to my late father's surviving sibling, my uncle Wilbert Harrison Wright, for his 95th birthday. So, it's never too late to go digging. Thirty or so years of poking around, going to family reunions in five different states, asking questions, 
sometimes with a plan, other times on a whim, and I keep finding more connections of family history, which just goes to show that not all records are found in archives. You have to be curious, downright nosy at times, and lucky. DNA testing has enabled black people to make great strides in creating family tree connections that may not have otherwise been possible due to lack of reliable records. In 2007 and again in 2013, I submitted saliva samples to two different DNA testing centers which placed my African genetic markers in what is currently known as Ghana, Senegal, and Cameroon. The 2013 results essentially mirrored the 07 results in Africa while also placing 33% of my DNA in Europe, 15% in Ireland. No real surprises there. Earlier in our country's history, the Irish were their own castigated ethnic group and were given only mild societal elevation over those of African descent. Apparently, misery really loved company. In 2013, when I received my second set of DNA results, I was coincidentally volunteering as a Boy Scout counselor for the merit badge called Genealogy. My son, Evan, who later became an Eagle Scout, was in this course. As you might assume, I took great personal interest in teaching this class. Boy Scouts, now referred to as Scouting USA, is my connection to Carol and her husband, David. Another special thing happened as a result of the 2013 test submission. As most of you know, the Ancestry.com internal database enables subscribers to correspond with each other on a personal messaging system for folks trying to see if they're related, based on first, second, third cousin status, and further. I was contacted by a man named Ray Cunningham, who wrote that the algorithm estimated with 99% confidence that we were related. He went on to tell me family stories. <laughs> I had met my second griot. However, Neither his surname nor his current city of residence, Chicago at the time, matched any information on my tree records. We were both perplexed. How could the science be so off? I hadn't mentioned earlier to you, but around the time that I went to visit Woodson in 2011, I also began making YouTube videos telling my family history story. Up to that point, I had created six episodes over a period of about four years. The first episode was an intro, seeds, second, my mom's side, limbs, third, my dad's side, limbs, combined sides, fruit, and so on. I said to Ray, watch the episodes and see if there's anything that he could find to connect us. I sent him the six video links. It wasn't long before he called me back to exclaim, it's episode number three. He went on to fill in a large swath of names, dates, and photos to a portion of my father's maternal tree branches that were, up to that point, mostly bare. It turned out that Ray's great-grandmother and my great-grandmother were sisters, born in the mid-19th century in North Carolina. The science was accurate. Ray later visited me in California two times. I ended up making a seventh video installment based on his life. I called it New Growth. I'm actually in the early stages of an eighth episode due out this coming summer. One key observation that I made somewhere along the way was that my family's history on both sides, why they lived where they lived, why they worked where they worked, and why they moved to where they moved, tracks almost perfectly with African American history of their time, which again tracked with the broader story of American history. Its laws, its customs, at times breathtakingly forward-thinking, and at others, breathtakingly loathsome and historically inequitable. Which brings us all together today. As I mentioned at the outset, my goal was to share all that I think I know about African American genealogy, largely from a series of my personal life's experiences. I'm still reading, learning, and sharing. I'm still getting to know my past better. Today was hopefully an opportunity for you to get to know me better for our collective future as Americans. My stories and my sharing demonstrate the way that I walk in the world and my desire for an informed and an enlightened coexistence in this country. 
when we part, take a little bit of our time together with you. As I have said in other places, and it fits here as well, this too shall bridge.